So how is uh, lab one going? It has already started. First week has passed. Did you face any issue? What issues did you face? Yeah, yeah. So basically, like the the wireless uh, reduce connected between different PCs. One one. Well, we're still investigating this even from last year. It seems to be like a fundamental technical problem. But one one thing to put in mind is, or at least to guard against this a little bit, is uh, make sure. Well, we'll do two things. One of them in the demo time, we will make sure that whoever is demoing is the only one that is connected to be able to exclude this problem from any other problem. But while you are working on the lab, one way to address this is, uh, and I know it's not really very user friendly, but uh, so those two wireless components, receiver and sender, they hook up when they come up, when they power up, right? So something you can try is when you power those up, nothing else is connected. So you basically power them up together and then power another one, another one, another one. Once they hook together, once they establish the connection at the beginning, uh, they will not go some, somewhere else, right? So what I'm trying to say is it's not really a runtime problem, it's rather an establishing connection problems. It only happens at the beginning when you really connect both, right? So if you try to, what well, you align together on the lab, that, that each group connect one at a time and do it sequentially, it should exclude most of the problems. This is from our experience last year, right? I'm hoping I'm in contact with, with NXP and I, I, I hope we find a more uh, easier solution and a more, I would say, uh, sustainable solution. But for now, this might be something that can help you. Okay. Did you face any other issue? Do you have any other feedback you want to share about the lab? Okay. Again, just approach me at any time if you want to share anything. Uh, any feedback is, is welcome. This is the second time we do the labs, so hopefully it's more stable than last year. Um, the feedback we got from the students last year is it, it was, well, quite fine, given that this is the first offering. But uh, but again, it doesn't mean that you're not facing any issue. It's just a matter of we we'll figure it out together, right? Good. So last time we started the topic of the I/O discussion in a, in an abstract way. So what are the protocols? What does it mean by internal bus, external bus? How I/Os in embedded systems are different than general purpose systems, uh, and how do we do the 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 connection for different protocols? So we didn't go through the protocols in detail, because this is something that you can very easily find uh, in the data sheet or in the specification of the protocol. And I'm sure also there are so many videos around the internet to explain how the protocol works. Uh, but we wanted rather to give you the engineering perspective. What are the trade-offs? What is the advantage, disadvantage when a protocol works better than another protocol? Good. So it's just a holistic view of different IO uh, protocols that are very common in embedded systems. Today, Today's lecture is a continuation of last lecture uh, because the reason we need a lot of IOs, as we mentioned last time, for embedded systems is we have a lot of sensors and actuators, right? Again, why that's the case? Because the nature of an embedded system is it is a cyber physical system. So you need to 
sends something from the physical wallet, you need sensors, which means it's some input device, and then you need to process the data, determine what action, what is the right action to take, and then actuate the physical wallets. You need an actuator as well. Good. So the reason why we have the last lecture is in fact today's lecture, having sensors and actuators. And, and this is again aligns pretty much with what you do in lab one. Uh, some of the discussions we will do today is uh, discussions of sensors and actuators, both of them from a, a general classification, uh, well, analog versus digital. Uh, what, what does it mean to have a DAC and ADC? I would assume you have dealt with DACs and ADCs before. Is that correct? No. OK, so did you deal with it from a practical perspective, for example, in the second year project, or you also had a coverage of the theory in some sort of an electronics course. Do you know how does it really work? Again, you guys are educating me, so sh share some information from you of what you have covered already. For example, do you know how EDC internally works or ADAC? Internally? Did you cover this in some some other course? Usually this is covered in digital electronics course, but I'm not sure if you had that or you only used it, for example, in the in the 2DX project. What did you do? You only use it, but you don't know internally the theory. How does it work? Yeah. yeah. So you did cover this already. OK, OK, so. In a microprocessors. OK, that's the course based or the project based version, the project based version. So you had OK, so good, good. So this is part of the theory is how how really do you do convert it from analog to digital, for example? through sampling and then quantization errors and how you measure those errors, et cetera. Good, so this, this is great because we will touch on some of this today as well. And then after this general classification that applies both to sensors and actuators, uh, we will discuss sensors uh, in a little bit, again, similar to the IO lecture and similar to the style of the course in a uh, bird's eye view, focusing more on the trade-offs and then try to connect this with what we do in the lab. Good. So accelerometer, gyroscopes, magnometer, um, magne mag magnetometer, a GPS, rather later cameras, things that are very common in autonomous systems. But what is important, and I believe this is what differentiates a little bit, this might be a new information for you, is if you are going to use a sensor in a real industrial project, for example, or even something you do as a hobby, but beyond the simple Arduino and interfacing, uh, what are the trade-offs you want to look for in a sensor? For example, if you look into the data sheet, what does it mean to have uh, the linearity or the non-linearity of the sensor data? Um, well, what is the bias there? Uh, is there a dynamic range and how to deal with it? And how does it impact the design of the overall project? Well, quantization, you already mentioned this in uh, the ADC, or well, noise sampling calibration. And for the actuators, we focus on two main things, the DC motor and the BWM, because this is the main focus of, of the lab. So recall that, again, the whole reason we are doing this today, it connects with our big picture of an embedded system. Without a sensor and an actuator, in fact, you don't have an embedded system in, in, this, in the definition of that course, right? Um, even if you think of general purpose embedded system, something in your, in your phone, for example, you do have a lot of sensors and you have actuators as well. Those actuators might not be really doing something physical outside of the phone, Right, as of now, uh, but it still can be in the general sense of an actuator. But if you think beyond this uh, consumer based embedded systems, if you think about something in a, a washing machine or again, a self driving car, the thing we do in the lab, without an actuator, without changing the physical wallet, we take away the cyber physical system nature of the embedded system. It's no longer the embedded system we are defining in that course. Good. So without this lecture, in fact, we don't have the theme of. Uh, of embedded systems. Good. Uh, I already had this lecture from uh, the IO uh, lecture last time, and we already identified some of them, uh, so there is no need to go through it again. Uh, but then it might be useful to try to connect this with what we do in the lab. So this this picture of the of the car, it's an earlier version uh, before we really modify it to the way that you currently have. For example, we don't use the GPS because we do an indoor lab, but rather we use the camera and the ultrasonic. But the concepts would remain uh, very similar. So if we try to find what are the sensors and actuators we have in our car, well, let's start with, um, with the actuators part. 
So if you look into, able to see my mouse moving somewhere. No. Maybe if I switch. Play. Yeah, OK, now we are able to see. So we have the EEC. You already, I would assume you have already used in the earlier experiments of lab one. What is EEC? This is basically the controller of the mode, right? So this is the bridge. If you remember our last IO lecture, we needed an IO controller between the CPU and the IO device you are connecting, right? EEC here is that exact example, right? This is the thing that is taking the signal from the FMU or to be more accurate or scientific, it's taking the signal coming out of the ARM M4 processor, the Cortex M4 processor from the FMU and feeding the correct BWM and connect set, correct settings to the motor. Good. And then we have the motor itself, which is in fact the actual physical entity we are modifying. And then we have the servo motor, which is the one that is responsible for the orientation of the wheels. Good. So these are examples of actuators you deal with in lab one. If I look into sensors on the other side, well, this is the actual board of the FMU. I know you didn't have a chance to see this because it's inside the packet of the, um, the, the white packaging, but this is how it looks from inside. In, in the board of this FMU, there is already the IMU uh, uh, unit, which has a gyroscope, uh, an accelerometer, but we also have a GPS. Well, this one we don't, we don't really use for the setup of the lab, but instead we have the camera and the ultrasonic. These are examples we will deal with in, in the lab of sensors. Good. Now, what is important is that if you look into the block diagram from the data sheet, so let me is it this, and if I try to go a little bit bigger, can I find this? Oh, I exited the full screen. That's interesting. It means I cannot really magnify this, but uh, let me see. Don't think there is a way to make it bigger. OK, so you, you already have access to this block diagram anyway. Uh, let me just go one step back here. So this block diagram we have here, you will find that how, remember the abstraction we discussed last time, which is connecting the microcontroller, the CPU to the actual IO, uh, uh, to the actual IO device. Then you will find that in the middle here, this is the, um, the kinetics processor, the BX for the actual MCU. But then you will find, well, you will find connections to for example, through SPI to the accelerometer, and then through, um, well, it's very hard to read from here as well, but you'll find that there is an EDC as well that comes from another sensor and there is a DAC as well. So inside this chip, we in fact have most of the components, and this is one reason why we picked it up. So on the board itself, we don't need to connect separate sensors. There is already the sensors, and the needed DAC and the AGCs that to interface with them in addition to the bus protocols. So it's it's something that is packaged as a full system, right? So going away from our example, which might be a lab setup example, and look into something like Google Card, for example. So in this in these slides, I have a couple of examples, one from Google and another one from Tesla. So if we look into if we look into the Google Card example, you'll find that there is a camera which is in the top. There is a later, uh, well, cameras are in fact three seconds, so it's already also mounted on top of this, like uh, later unit as well. But we have the later unit also, which is constantly kind of spinning to have a, a, a three sixty uh, image view of the whole surroundings, right? And then in addition to this, in both sides of the car, you have the radar sensors. The main purpose of the radar is to, well, radar is Consider the more expensive version of an ultrasonic. Ultrasonic is just very cheap. You can imagine that it's not really used uh, heavily in actual autonomous cars because uh, ultrasonic has uh, a lot of noise and very short distance. Instead, they use uh, uh, readers 
and, and radars are used for the same purpose we're going to use the ultrasonic in the last lab, which is measuring the distance with surroundings, right? So radar and cameras both gives you some sort of a view as an image or a video capture of the surroundings, but it doesn't measure distance. You need to do some additional algorithms to do so. Radars, on the other hand, gives you distance immediately, so you are able to measure. So I don't take pictures as a radar uh, sensor, but I rather give you immediate distance of surroundings, like obstacles, sidecars, pedestrians, etc. Et and I do this, as you can see, from uh, both sides of the car and the front and the back. Good. One question to you that I will also visit a little bit later. Wh why do we have all of this? For example, I'm telling you that leaders and cameras are both capturing some sort of a view or, or an image capturing of the surroundings. Why I only don't use camera or a leader? Why both? And at the same time, if I can from the image, well, I have the image so I can calculate the distance using some sort of algorithm. Why I also use radars, right? Seems to be a waste of resources then. What do you think? So I want you to keep questioning, right? Like basically when I see a picture like this, it's like Google car, it doesn't mean that this is, well, your view should be completely different than someone just surfing the news, right? You guys are engineers. So when you read something, you have to associate it to start thinking, okay, this is a design. Another engineer, in fact, came up with this architecture of a group of engineers, why they are doing so, right? What are the traders? Object detection and stuff like that. Uh, or, 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 or. Yeah, great. Yeah, definitely. This is basically one of the reasons is maybe those sensors have different processing time. So if I need the distance in a shorter time, which is our uh, time budget, if you remember our early discussions of timing requirements of embedded systems, then maybe I shouldn't be waiting for camera processing frame rate per second, do the algorithm, and then get out the distance and just use the radar directly, right? But then this is kind of saying, why do we need the radars? I guess you also answered the question of we need the cameras to also do some sort of image processing and uh, detecting uh, surroundings. But for example, why do I need both leaders and cameras here? Or multiple cameras here? Good. So why do we need them? Maybe one of the cameras stop Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. So, so this is definitely a reason. So, given that this is a safety critical system, remember we defined that this is a safety critical system. You cannot rely only on one source of information. What is your camera, as your friend said, goes malfunctioning, for example, or it goes off, right? Then that's one reason that you want redundancy, and hence there is this concept of sensor fusion, right? That I collect through the surroundings, the same information from different sources, completely independent sources. Now these are even different sensors and then take the best decision out of the collective information. So I don't depend only on one source. Good. So this is one reason. Another reason, as we'll see later on, cameras and, and, and leaders and radars, they operate better in different environments, right? For example, whether you are in dark or in light, whether the weather is harsh or is clear, right? So those kind of information it doesn't mean that one sensor is the best across all the conditions that they are driving on. For example, if we're talking about an autonomous car or flying one, if we're talking about a drone, right? So you need sensor fusion as well. This concept of sensor fusion is using multiple different sensors and then run some algorithm to get the best result. Not only because of redundancy, the same environment you are in, but because those operate, they have their own trade-offs. So some of them are better in different conditions, right? And this is very important as we will touch on later on. Good. So we have been talking about sensors and actuators, but we didn't define them. So what do we really do? So a sensor simply measures a physical quantity. So we do sensing of the physical wallet. So I do measure something that is reading from the physical wallet and translate it into some sort of a digital signal that the processor can understand. The actuator on the other hand is the output from your system. So it's the part that is modifying the physical quantity, right? Some of the considerations you have to do is, well, do I have analog signal or digital signal, analog sensor or a digital sensor? So you definitely know by now what is the difference between an analog signal and digital signal, right? Digital is only zeros and ones, right? So it, it has a quantized view. 
uh, and analog means it's a continuous signal, like sinusoid, for example. Um, I, I wouldn't go deeply into the discussion of what are the advantages, disadvantages of using an analog system versus a digital one, uh, because you might be surprised that, in fact, this is one of the hot areas of discussion, especially in autonomous systems and uh, machine learning. Well, that's a nice way of dealing with an embedded system or non embedded system. Okay. Good. So, well, so from what we have right now, if you're going to make a judgment, which one is more common? Analog or digital? Right now. Yeah, news and potential. Yeah, I mean, okay, maybe I should have specified the question because it's 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 not a trick. Like what I meant by more common is more common in uh, embedded systems, right? Or or actual computing systems, not around us in the world, right? So what do you think? Would you still say analog or digital? Okay, so digital is the most commonly used right now in most systems, right? And the reason is why that's the case. Yeah, does it mean that if I go for analog, I, I cannot use transistors? I mean, circuits that deal with analog are still transistor based, right? What do you think? So why the wallet decided double or maybe, yeah, two to three decades ago to move completely to the digital domain? Yeah. Exactly, thank you. That's That's the fundamental reason is it's much easier for us to process. Well, us means CPUs, right? Not humans, to process zeros and ones rather than a continuous signal. In fact, there is no way at all you can process an like an, a continuous signal from the from the actual current CPUs, right? There are other fields of research where, in fact, people are trying to say instead of having zero and one only, you have what they call multimodal logic, where I have multiple levels, and hence I get closer to the analog domain. There is also this whole area of research of what if I have an actual analog circuitry, uh, mainly through resistors and some other combination? But the reality is, current CPUs as we know them deal best with quantized signals. Easy zero, zero or one. One means it's five volt or some sort of high voltage. Zero means a low voltage. Much easier to process, to store the data, and to deal with it. Right? This is one reason. The second reason is, if you think from a communication perspective, it's much easier and less noise to transfer those zeros and ones and retrieve them in the receiver case, right? So if you have taken a communications course, then transferring a digital signal is in fact much more robust than transferring an analog signal because first of all, you quantize your information, so it takes less number of bits, and also the noise to retrieve your signal back at the receiver side is much less because again, it's quantized, right? While on the other hand, if you want to transfer an actual analog signal, remember that within even well, in this representation that we have here, if, if those are representing exactly the same number of bits, here I only need to retrieve one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. But here I need to retrieve almost every single aspect of the sinusoidal graph, which is very, very tough, right? This is why digital signals are right now more common. But what is the problem with this? The problem is, well, this is our own view, our own abstraction of signals as CPUs. But the reality is most signals around us, as your friend said at the beginning, are in fact analog signals, right? If I'm measuring some physical quantity from the wallet, the world is not quantized, not discrete, right? It's a continuous signal processing. Think, for example, about a sensor that you put in a patient to measure its uh, ECG, right, signal. ECG is a continuous signal. Your heart rate keeps like, beeping, right? It goes all the way continuous. It cannot be zeros and ones. So you need to do some sort of translation between this analog actual signal in the physical wallet to the discrete digital signal that you want to process. This translation is what you guys mentioned at the beginning of sampling, quantization, and analog to digital converter, right? This is why EDC is, is now at the core of this digital wallet because we need to do a translation from the actual physical quantity to our own representation of this physical quantity as a digital signal. Good? Is that clear? Is there any question? Okay, so for that purpose, we need an ATC, as we said, to translate from an analog signal to a digital one. But also, this is from the side that you are sensing the physical wallet. Now, assume I want to actuate 
the, the physical wallet. So I need now to translate from the digital domain, the one I understand inside my FMU board, to the actual physical quantity, which is animal, the motor, for example, right? The motor speed. So in that case, you need, well, the opposite side of an ADC, which is a DAC, something that takes a digital signal and gives you the animal signal. If we look into our FMU, in fact, you find that we have both an ADC and a DAC. So, for example, here you have an ADC that simply takes your uh, analog signal coming from, for example, here through the ITC interface and translate it into the digital domain. Uh, where is the DAC? Are you able to spot it? I don't think it's in that image. But simply, we, we have this already on the board. Right? OK, so we discussed the analog versus digital. Uh, some examples of sen sensors that we already mentioned, well, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, GPS, ultrasonic, leader, radar, camera. And a combination of those are used in most systems, again, because you want to do sensor fusion. Uh, if we are going to touch on the basis of some of them quickly, and what does each one of them do, especially the ones we use in our lab? An accelerometer, uh, I would assume you have already used an accelerometer before, before even that course in 2DX as well. Yeah. So you guys know that what does it really measure? It's, it measures the acceleration of the system, right? Right. What is acceleration? Well, it's the derivative of speed, right? Uh, and the way it really works is through this simple law of that the force is equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration, right? And because I always have this uh, gravity force that you basically, well, this is the basic, this is the very basic uh, theory of an accelerometer. Most of accelerometers right now, including the one we have in our board, does not really work that way. But this is the best way to really understand how does the accelerometer work, is you just have this simple spring mass damper model, which you can even build your own at home. The way it works is if you just have the accelerometer in a, a balanced uh, uh, in, in a, in a, in a, in a standing, and then it's not accelerating at all, the main force that is impacting you is in fact the gravity force, correct? Once you start moving in one direction with a certain speed, now another force force comes into place, which is can be calculated as F equal MT. So if I know what is this force and I know the mass of my spring, I can really calculate the acceleration, right? This is really how it really works. And the acceleration also is a vectored uh, signal or measure, which means the direction of the acceleration, right? As I said, this is the very basic discrete format for educational purpose only. Most of the current systems are based on what we call a MEMS sensor. What is MEMS? MEMS refers to a microelectromechanical system. It's, it's one of the very common areas of research and industry. The main idea or the main challenge that's trying to solve is I cannot really have something like this in a car, right? Or something like this in a uh, in an uh, elder patient because I want to understand whether they are okay or accelerating uh, or maybe falling, right? So it's not very practical to use it. And it's even not very accurate. What do I do in a state is there is this concept of very micro uh, uh, mechanical components that can be placed on top of the board. So now you combine the electronics wallet with the mechanical wallet, right? It's more like a mechatronics thing. Uh, and so it's called MEMS, it comes from Microelectro and then mechanical system as well. It's composed of a very small mechanical structure. We're going to go through uh, uh, deeply how does it work. I have a video for you here to watch. Uh, but it's just this, the theory is exactly the same. You try to apply some sort of a force in a moving mechanical part. You know the force, you know the mass of the part, and then you can measure the acceleration. Good. OK. Another, is there any question here? I highly recommend that you guys watched that video, right? If we had enough time, well, in the past two lectures we had time, but in today I'm not very sure if we're going to make it to time, so I don't want to play the video here, but I would expect most of you to watch it, at least to understand really the parts you are using in the lab, how, how do they really work? If you don't know this already from before. Okay, a gyroscope. Well, 
what do we do for a gyroscope? Is you want to measure, well, we said that the accelerometer measures the acceleration in a direction, a vector acceleration, right? But you don't have the angular velocity. Basically, your velocity across a certain angle you have, right? Across your axis. This is used by the gyroscope. Why this is useful? Why do I need to do that? Well, think of a drone, for example. It's not enough to know what is the speed and acceleration of the drone, but also what orientation does it take? Because in drones, if you are speeding, but with some angular velocity, in fact, you might have the, you know, I don't know if some of you already know this, that the yaw and the three dimensions of a drone, then if you are accelerating, you might just flip the drone or change directions, right? So your orientation across the axis matters as well, not only the direction and the speed. And hence comes the gyroscope. Gyroscope is the main feature of this. Another application of gyroscope is, so again, I give you this medical uh, application. If you put this in an elderly patient, you want to make sure that they don't fall, right? Uh, unexpected. Then gyroscope is the one that really can tell you. Right? In your phone, do you know how gyroscope is being used? A very simple application of gyroscope that you almost do every day. Yeah, someone else? Someone else? <laughs> So, oh, same. Yeah, you. So, I, I, want, I, I want others to contribute as well. I appreciate really your contribution. I will come back to you if I lost the home and others, but let's see. Yeah, please. Yeah, orientation, exactly. So, if you are watching a video on YouTube and, and this like vertical view, but then you want it to be a full picture, you just flip it, right? But by flipping it, you don't do anything else. So, how does the software know that you want to change that view? The way it really works is that the operating system has a direct access to the sensors. Once you flip it in one direction, the gyroscope measures the orientation and feed this to the app, and then the app takes the corresponding action, please. Yeah, a compass is another sensor that we will come into, but so, so I'm trying to, so I'm trying to understand what is behind your question. So what about a compass related to this orientation we're talking about or related to something else? Yeah, so what we're talking about right now with the orientation of the phone, for example, orientation of the phone is just enough. You don't need to know the north versus others for this orientation. It's just a matter of you are changing your angular velocity in one direction, right? So you don't need the compass for that. But the compass is used for some other place. For example, if you're going through, like you're driving and using Google Maps with the GPS, you are also using the compass to know what, what direction you're going through, right? Uh, and by the way, compass in, in a phone is one of the least accurate uh, sensors in in, in in the phone, but but that that's one of the problems also we have in phones is that you it's a different story. So why people, for example, don't rely heavily on the phone sensors to do some more useful stuff, for example, again in healthcare, because they are not designed to be. Remember our first lecture, they are not designed to be certified. They are only used for consumer based market. Well, if you flip the video that way and your phone doesn't work, nobody cares, right? But if you are using it for a patient or using it in a in a in an autonomous car and it's not really working as you expect, it's the dust, right? So it's it's also the accuracy, but I will come into this discussion of how do we measure different sensors, right? And, and their accuracy and noise and, and linearity later on, good? Okay. So again, this, I'm showing you another, well, this this might be, um, you can imagine that in a, in a gyroscope, uh, it, it, well, how mechanically or a bigger gyroscope, how does it really work? But in reality, it's a MEMS, very small parts with some angular rate across this thing. So I, this is not a video. This is more like a link of explaining how does it work. Uh, I wasn't able to find a, a reasonably good video. If we found, just post on, on the teams as well. Now we come into the magnetometer, which is your question about the, the compass, right? Uh, what we really measure there is, um, well, the end, the outcome is what is your orientation, right? Like north, south, etc. But in fact, it doesn't really measure this directly. What it measures is it measures the magnetic field around you, what we call the Hall effect or the Hall effect. Uh, and maybe something you want to understand as an engineer is compass is only one use case of a magnetometer, right? It's it's not so. Maybe I can go one step further and say compass is not the actual sensor itself. It's one application of the sensor. So magnetometer is the actual sensor. We can use its outcome 
for uh, for our north orientation, which is a compass in some applications, but we can use it for some other uses as well, including proximity, wheel speed. Well, in, in autonomous systems, it's mainly used for for, for wheel speed, um, but it's used for some other for some other things. Good. Uh, for example, proximity. If well, if you are like basically having some sort of an electric field around you that emits a magnetic field, another car that has the same thing. Through measuring this, it's less accurate though, uh, you can really have proximity estimate between the two objects. Okay? Good. So at the beginning of the lecture, and I believe last lecture as well, I mentioned to you that we have what we call an IMU. Okay? On top of the FMU board we have. What is an IMU? I, I never mentioned IMU sensor so far. IMU is a collection of sensors. It's something that is named inertial measurement unit. It combines multiple sensors together that are together that is usually used in drone systems, right? So an IMU unit includes an accelerometer, gyroscope, and sometimes, most of times, it includes a magnetometer as well. The one we have includes the three. Good. It's commonly used in again maneuvering the a drone, used in satellite systems, anything that also needs this yawing thing. Uh, and well, again, the roll and, and pitch orientations of the drone uh, is based on an IMU. Good. So one thing that I believe I have mentioned to you earlier as well is the K66 board we have from NXP. It was designed mainly for drones, right? Um, but it's then used for uh, the buggy system we have. Good. The reason for this is the theory of the system, both systems, autonomous car and autonomous UV or, or a drone, is just almost exactly the same. I can use the same hardware, and this is what I like about the setup. Is later on, for some reason, if the restrictions of flying something becomes easier, then we can really shift the lab as well, or at least some of the projects to use a drone. But the whole setup you are dealing with in the lab, if you wanted to replicate it exactly for a drone, you can do though. Uh, you can do so. And also the NXB website, I can share that with you, shows you how to do it. For It's called, I believe, a, a Hoover Games draw, right? Uh, this is why it has an AMU initially, not for the buggy, uh, but mainly for the draw. But we are using it for the lab, basically, to, to also later on drive the, the, the car on its own. So now, coming back to what we have on the board, how do we have this AMU? So we have what we call, well, this, this number, FXO S8700 CQ, it's a six axis sensor, which is an AMU, that combines accelerometer and magnetometer sensors in a very small uh, form factor. Um, it's basically composed of a 14 bit accelerometer. Later on, we will understand what is this 14 bit. And then a 16 bit magnetometer. So, does anyone can tell us when I say a 14 bit accelerometer, what do I really mean by that? It has to do with the discussion we had earlier about analog versus digital and DAX and EDCs. Resolution, that, thank you, or accuracy. So simply, we said this is a sensor that is, that is sensing a physical quantity, and then you represent it in the digital domain. The more bits you have, remember we had this signal? Yeah, something like here. This is a good example. You take an analog signal, and then you translate it into a series of bits, right? The more bits you have, the more sampling you do in the ADC terminology, which means less quantization you need, which means more accuracy or resolution, right? This is why when we say 14 bit or 15 bit or 12 bit, this is for a single measure of the sensor. How many bits do I end up having as an output? And then a 16 bit magnetometer, both are combined and ASIC. Uh, here, I guess what I'm, I'm taking is just I'm copying exactly the thing from the data sheet. Uh, and again, this is the same picture where you can spot this IMU. Uh, let me see. Yeah, you can see here that this is acceleration vector magnitude. Uh, bah, 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 bah. It's transient acceleration detection as well. Uh, where to find the magnetometer? One one thing also about that board, yeah, orientation detection here. Okay, that's good. So it's 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 this embedded sensor basically inside it and including the ADC. So this is the well, it's called Freescale because Freescale was a big company in British systems that NXB purchased. So this K66 was initially developed by 
uh, Freescale and then NXP added into it. But so th this is the actual data sheet of this sensor, which in fact you can buy as standalone. But what we have on the board is it's already mounted there. Good. So another thing that unfortunately you will not see in the lab again because we tried this accuracy, it doesn't really work very well indoors. That's why we replaced it with the camera. Uh, but we do have that component, so it's it's um, it's a GPS. Um, well. What does GPS stand for? Global Positioning System. All of us use it nowadays. Uh, originally, it was a US government uh, project and then well, it was opened for, for the world. Uh, some of the fundamental information about how GPS really works is that I can use. So the idea is through a certain number of satellites around the world, which is already known, I don't know, like right now, might be 12 or something like that. But simply, if I can send radio signals from satellites moving at constant speed. And then if I know you are in a certain position based on, well, think of, of the, maybe I will give you a completely different example. In using your phone in communication systems, how can I use your phone even if you have you don't have a GPS to determine where you are? Do you know? It's like conspiracy theory. So how do I know even if you don't have a, if you have a very old phone that does not have a GPS or anything, how can I still know your location up to a certain accuracy? Yeah. Well, assume we don't have to satellite because if you have a normal phone, you don't communicate to satellites, right? This is what we're going to go through in a GPS, but I don't have a GPS. Yeah. Assume I don't have a Wi-Fi. So I have a very old Nokia like uh, phone that doesn't have a Wi-Fi, GPS, anything that is smart. Yeah. Exactly. So it's basically using the BTS of the communication system. If you are talking in your phone, uh, that means you are exchanging signals with certain towers, which are called BTS in communication. And those, I well, as a as a for example, the operator, I know where my towers are, right? So I know their location. Through those towers, I can in fact have a very accurate map of the whole city, right? Then when you make a call, you are sending signals and receiving signals. Usually the way it works is you communicate with the nearest tower to you, right? Because you want the signal to be as powerful as you as you can. In that case, I can really measure where you are by measuring this, the distance, well, what tower you are talking to, and based on the accuracy of the signal, I can even measure between which two towers you are. If you are moving, and this is also, by the way, it happens very easily, then I can know where are you heading or your direction because you keep switching between different towers and hence you are moving in a certain direction, right? This is really how we can someone detect your, your place and, and direction even without any smart uh, GPS or Wi-Fi or anything through only BTS or, or communication uh, cellular network basically. Now, going from that example to the GPS example, it works exactly the same way, but through the GPS. Satellites, if they cover the Earth in a certain way, I can build a map of them because satellites are in fixed place. If they send signals, and you communicate with them through a GPS, then I can measure now, well, those signals, this radio signals coming from the satellite have a fixed speed. If they come back to me as a satellite with some delay now and some other delay later on, this difference in delay, I can, and based on the, all the delays from all the satellites, I can determine what is your direction and what is your speed for that direction. Does this make sense? This is really how, it's a very easy theme, it's just the deployment that, that that is in fact complex. You want to make sure that you place the satellites in places that does a complete coverage, right, of the whole Earth. And then based on these calculations or algorithms you run afterwards, you can determine the speed and the direction. Okay, one, one of the big problems with GPS when it comes to embedded systems or even drones, or it's still an ongoing problem, is indoor uh, navigation, right? So because GPS, if we are dealing with satellites, then well, it's not very accurate if you deal with a, if you're inside a mall, for example, right? Uh, or underground or, or some, something indoor. So what they will try to do is to supplement this GPS with well, a lot of directions. One of them is what they call indoor GPS. But the one that is more successful is through the Wi-Fi networks, right? Uh, so I can have a supplemental, and this is again the concept of sensor fusion. If you go indoors, I depend less on the GPS, but rather I depend more into what is inside that indoor 
thing. Like in a mod, for example, there is a Wi-Fi signal, and then based on the Wi-Fi signal, and again, I know where are my routers. Same theory exactly. Where are my routers? What is the strength of your signal? If you are keep switching between different routers, then I can determine where are you going. And then I have a map of the place, then I can place you on the map. Good. And this is usually fit as indoor navigation as well. Good. So one of the easy ones, and we will deal with this on the last lab, is the ultrasonic one. Ultrasonic uses, well, sound waves. So it's called ultrasonic to detect objects. So you, you simply, it's, it's very cheap. That's why it's also very commonly used for, for projects. You send a sound signal, it hits an object, and then you basically measure the echo that comes back to you. And based on the strength of that echo and how much time it takes to reach you, you know, or you have an estimate of where this object is related to the sound signal you sent. For example, if there is an obstacle in front of you, the echo will be very uh, uh, strong and it will come back to you very quick, right? This is why it's also short range, because if, if this obstacle is very far, it's usually, I believe, less than a couple of meters. And if, if the object is very far from you, then, well, the sound signal becomes very weak, the echo is very weak, you're not able to make a, a reasonable decision. And so why, again, ultrasonic is not used in actual cars, but rather uh, radars are used. Good. In the last lab, you will do this experiment yourself. So you will connect the ultrasonic uh, well, you go through the data sheet, understand how to interpret the signal. You write the equations that takes the signal measured and gives you the distance. We will run this in Raspberry Pi and then use the ROS communication signal with the BX4 to control the, B, the, the, the K6X processor from the Raspberry Pi itself. Right? So we'll have the full cycle uh, of taking an actual, since a physical entity, take an action, and then you either stop the car or move right or move left. Is there any question so far? Okay, finally, radar. So instead of using sonic waves, which again can become very weak and not very accurate, we use radio waves instead to detect objects. The good thing about radars is it's not really like based on weather conditions, not like camera, for example. So for that purpose, it's also commonly used because at the very least, if I lost my if I lost my cameras in in a, in a severe harsh weather, I can still know whether I have obstacles or not, so I don't hit someone while I'm driving. Uh, its problem is that it it has a low resolution, so so it's very uh, resilient in terms of weather and measurement because it, it it's dependent on radio waves. But at the same time, it's not very accurate. Good. And finally, we have the leader, which is one of the very common and maybe. Uh, expensive ones in self-driving cars. Uh, I believe the third year car project, uh, the control course, they are using a leader. We're using a camera instead. Uh, it basically uses laser, so a leader, because it uses light waves. So try to compare these things. So the radar is using a radio wave, ultrasonic is using sonic waves, and the leader is using a light wave. If you have a 360 degree leader, which is the one that keeps spinning, then it get, can give you very accurate information. Something that is very common in using laters gives you the depth, right? So if you compare a later to a normal camera, the advantage is you can have the depth of your image. What, what do you mean by depth? So when you take a picture and it's 2D, well, you're not able to determine from the picture who is, well, as a human, our brain is able to really estimate, right? So for example, if I take like a snapshot of picture of this, uh, I show you right now, I'm able to tell if I see the picture later on that, well, this distance might be 10x the distance that Ali is setting here, right? So I, I know an estimate of, because I have seen so many pictures, your, your, your brain is easily estimating this. You want to mimic this in a machine, that once you take a picture, it's not really a 2D picture, which cameras, in fact, cannot do by default. We have depth cameras, but it's a different story. Later can do this, so it only it doesn't only give you uh, uh, some sort of, uh, I don't want to say a picture because it doesn't really take a picture as a camera, but it gives you an, a view of the surroundings, including the depth. Why depth is important? Well, for example, determine the speed. When should I stop? Is this obstacle is very nearby or still ahead? So a lot of the driving decisions depend really on the depth or the distance, right? One problem with 
<laughs> excuse me. One problem with the later is it's quite expensive compared to others. Right now, there are developments to make it also cheaper. Uh, for example, instead of using one very big expensive uh, one, have multiple that are cheaper, but then do sensor fusion. It's still in flux. And in fact, in self-driving company domain, uh, there are what we call two campaigns. Campaigns, a campaign that is really saying, well, cameras, in fact, should be everywhere. That's the dominant one. I, we don't use leaders. The other campaign is using, well, let's use leaders as the, our main sensor, and then we might add cameras later on. Do you know we, what, what big companies are in which campaign? Like the camera campaign who is really mainly taking care of that or like pushing towards that usage? Yes, exactly. Thank you. And what leader? Google car. Google is mainly the one that is pushing towards using leader as, as the main sensor. Good. Then camera. Good thing is you can very you can get a very good high high resolution. In fact, higher than anything else. Uh, with low cost, right? So it's 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 inexpensive. The problem with the camera is because it's inexpensive. It requires a lot of processing afterwards, right? So the challenge with the camera and one of its advantages is the hardware is stable, it's cheap, you can really depend on it if you have the processing power to really take the decision afterwards. Something good about laters, et cetera, et cetera, the, the earlier sensors is it gives you the output that would require minimal processing. Good. Camera, on the other hand, does not do any processing, at least most cameras. They take the picture of the video frame, give it to you, do whatever you want. So you get the highest resolution with the lowest cost. As far as you can really accommodate for the highest computation you need to do afterwards. Okay? This is what we mean by require high computation capacity. Something bad about cameras, uh, not good in bad withers, and it's not very good also in depth. I know some of you would can say, okay, we have some depth cameras, right? Uh, which really works good for this. We might have cameras that also work for night and some bad weather, but still compared to leaders, it's not very successful. Good. So there are trade-offs, right? So to recap what we have discussed so far, so we have digital versus analog discussion that applies mainly for sensors and actuators. And then based on digital versus analog, we have the ADC and that components that are fundamental in any embedded system. We have covered some of the sensors that are very common, especially the ones we use in the in the car, in the lab, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, IMU, ultrasonic, laser, laser, and camera. Now, why we are doing this? Again, the theme is not to really give you the theory of each single one and how does it work, but rather discuss the trade-offs as a system engineer or an embedded system engineer, what do you need to do? So this is a very good study of comparing sensors from different angles. So you can see here, well, the sensor cost is an angle. The size is an angle. What the detection is speed. So how much time does it take you to detect this? Why detection is speed is important. So remember, we are dealing with safety critical real time systems. So timing budget is very important. And then whether you have color of interest or not, uh, can you work in harsh uh, um, environment, like including snow, fog or rain, uh, works in bright versus dark, the resolution and the range. If we take the leader, as an example, you will find that the leader is very good in working on regardless of whether it's dark or bright, it doesn't really matter. Resolution is quite good, right? Uh, range is also quite good, and detection speed is very, very fast. Good. So it's trying to basically have a comparison between different sensors from all these angles, from all these design trade offs that a self driving car or an autonomous system engineer would have to worry about. For example, if I take the radar on the other hand, well, compare this to this, you'll find that the radar is in fact much less cost, right? So it has advantages as, as the cost and the size is much less. It's also faster than the later, so speed is quite good. It works also for dark and bright. Its resolution is a bit a bit less than the later. Uh, but then if I go back here, this one does not really provide almost any color contrast. The same thing here as well. Right. If I go to the camera, well, let's keep the, the ultrasonic. Uh, the last one, because it's the one that cannot compete with others, but passive visual is basically what we refer to as the camera, the one that does not do any processing. You will find that its resolution is the highest range is the highest as well. It's quite good from a cost perspective. Cameras are very low cost. You can really buy a, a cheap camera for Raspberry Pi, like 
know, twenty dollars, ten dollars, right? The one we have in the lab is in that range. I'm not saying this is used in an actual self-driving Tesla or Google car, but it's a relatively cheap sensor compared to others. And so why you find it everywhere. For example, I, I don't know how many cameras Tesla's car have, but you can see from the picture I had earlier, they have cameras everywhere, right? On the other hand, what is the disadvantage? Well, if you look into harsh weather conditions, snow, fog, rain, very bad there. Works in dark, well, not very good as well. And detection speed. Why detection speed is not good for camera? Because again, look into the name. We called it passive visual. It does not do any processing for you. You take the frame as is, the frame per second as is, and then you process it yourself, right? So you can see that there is multiple trade-offs between different sensors. Not every one is good in every single thing. And this takes us to what I mentioned earlier as a sensor fusion concept, which is one of, again, hot areas in research and industry as well. In sensor fusion, I add multiple of these sensors and take the advantages of all of them in addition to the redundancy that your friend said earlier. So if you try to combine those, you'll find that you get the best of everything, right? So here I'm combining the passive visual, well, ultrasonic, the one that we missed to, to talk about, and then the, the radar as well, the orange one. So you, you kind of cover most of that. If I go back to the ultrasonic just to have the funny discussion, ultrasonic is good in, well, the only thing that's good as proximity detection, right? It does not depend on dark or bright because it doesn't use the light as your own wave, but rather use the sonic wave. But speed is bad, accuracy or resolution and range is quite bad. Sensor size is very small and it's very low cost, like a couple bucks, right? But you can see from the things that really matter from industry perspective, ultrasonic is not very useful. I'm talking about the autonomous cars. It can, it can have other applications as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there is there are two big camps, leader camp and camera camp. You can also read about this if, if you are interested more. But the leader camp is saying, well, I should be using the leader and have a detailed 3D mapping as my software. Uh, and then this is more than enough. The good thing about it, very accurate, explainable. What do I mean by explainable? Uh, well, this might be a bonus mark. It's a tough question. So when I say explainable versus not explainable for cameras, what I'm referring to? Yeah. Yeah, but for example, why for later, that does not exist. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah, please send me your name after the email. So the idea is that all oh, it's come. It comes from the fact that I told you earlier that cameras are cheap. Hardware is very high in terms of resolution but it offloads all the processing to you. So you need a lot of computation power. What is this computation power? It's in fact the machine learning algorithms that are going to process your, your images and videos and then take the actions accordingly. Once you bring in AI and machine learning into play, well, you deal with it as a black box. So a very big topic right now, especially in autonomous systems and certification systems, the explainability of AI. How can I really, if there is an accident that happens, Tesla car stuck on the road, or there is an accident that kills someone, who is responsible? How can I explain the decision that the AI has taken to hold either Tesla accountable or the driver accountable or the other driver accountable, right? So explainability is a big deal from a legal and liability perspective. From a leader perspective, it's very explainable because again, I don't depend heavily on machine learning processing because the sensor itself gives you the result in a clear format. Good. Like you don't need to do a lot of heavy processing to really determine what does it mean of this measurement. The camera, on the other hand, is not the case. I only get a picture, and everything I do afterwards is mine. Whether I detect this cat, this this picture as a cat or a human being or a mountain, it's up to the machine learning algorithm. Good. The bad thing about leader cam, it's expensive, as we said earlier. Uh, well, and, and the leader is expensive, but also the software mapping is expensive. And you can read about the licensing costs of either Uber Maps or Google Maps or Apple Maps. How, how much does it cost? With the camera cam, well, use the camera as a primary sensor. Their argument is that this is really how we function as humans anyway, using our eyes. The good thing is quite cheap compared to leaders. The bad thing mainly is explainability, right? And compared to the later, well, it can be a little bit non-accurate based on how good is your machine learning algorithm. Okay. Is that trade-off clear? Is there any question? 
OK, so here I show you an example of the autopilot from Tesla. So I got this from the Tesla website. And kind of explains to you how they combine different cameras together to really determine different ranges and different angles. For example, you have what we call a narrow forward camera. It tells you what is the maximum distance. Well, the trade off in cameras is it might be a wide angle, but in that case, your distance or your range is very short. You cannot really be both uh, uh, high range and uh, wide angle at the same time. It's either that or that. So what they do is they combine cameras with different features or capabilities. So they use what we call narrow forward camera. This is to maximize the distance in front of you, right? So it goes up to 250 meters as they claim. But then in addition to this, you have the main forward camera and the wide forward camera. So you can compare the narrow to the wide. The wide only has a range of 60 meters. So it's, it's range in one like uh, an or in, in one axis is very small, but then it's very wide. So you can compare the range of this camera here from the range of that camera. Yeah? And then something pretty similar to the rear for and, and rear and the sides as well. So I'm going to, to go deeply into this. And then here they explain how they can combine the wide and the main and the narrow to have a holistic view of the overall environment. So again, it applies the, so the concept of sensor fusion, but within the camera itself. I use different cameras with different types and capabilities. And at the end of the day, my algorithms would combine all of them together to have a better view of the surroundings. Right? Okay. Yeah, this, this is rear view and side view. So you, you can give this a look yourself. Good. So we had a high level system view discussion of sensors. Let's, let's go back and discuss some of the technicalities. So some of the design issues with sensors and what, what we need to care about. Some of the things is calibration. Do I need to calibrate my sensor? or it works out of the box. And how complex is the calibration? Linearity, sampling, noise, failure, and well, security attacks is, is, is one topic that is new and it's interesting to discuss. Let's start with calibration. So calibration coming from really the nature of the sensor itself and what does it do? So a sensor simply measures a physical quantity X. I will never report to you X as is, right? As I said, like you need to translate it at the very least from analog to digital domain. So for that purpose, if I want to mathematically represent this, I would say if I measure X as a physical quantity, what I'm really reporting to the computing system is another function of X, Fx, right? Something that depends on X. And then if you if we want to model a sensor, this is usually referred to as an affine model, you would say, as far as your fx, which is the function reported from the sensor, is linear in your actual x signal, you are good, right? Because there is an offset between both, but I can really determine, I can extract x from fx. Make sense? So I get x as an input, x is quite complex analog signal. Sensor reports to me fx, some sort of an encoding or detection of x in some sort of an affine model equation. But that's the simplistic theory-based model of a sensor. Later on, we will see that it's not very accurate as an affine model. But then a fine model guarantees me that if I have Fx, I can have a sense of what was X origin, correct? Because simply this A is what we call the sensitivity that when you read a data sheet, and B is your bias. So the reason I had this equation here is those two terms you will see in a data sheet of any sensor. What do they really mean? They tell you. How does the equation of the sensor model the actual physical quantity, right? How accurate is it is? Does it really magnify? Have again, for example, if you have a mic and then you want to magnify my, well, a mic is an example of an embedded system that has sensor and then translate it into digital and then magnify it, right? Using a power source. So I'm some system you need to really magnify your signal through a gain. Usually this is referred to as sensitivity because it can be a gain or a loss, depending on what is the sensor. And then there is some sort of a bias that is added. Um, and this bias is simply because of the noise, for example, right? or the actual functionality of the sensor itself. The main reason of calibration is I want to know what is A and what is B. Because without A and B, I cannot really extract X from Fx. So to calibrate your sensor means come up to a known value of A and B. Good. So an example here is applied to acceleration, for example. Assume I'm, I have this is my acceleration actual signal, which is X itself. And then there is some sort of measurement here. 
And then my sensor is reporting to me FX, which is the second line I have here. Assume it basically models, well, 3.6. The first thing you can observe here is the, the range of the signal X is very wide. Remember, this is the actual physical quantity. It's an analog signal, so the range can be anything. But then at the end of the day, the sensor might want to, well, quantize your signal into a smaller range, right? Because you have few number of bits, 12 bits, 14 bits, 9 bits. This is basically the comparison that is happening here, like 3.6 to 0 plus like 3.6 to 3. Uh, well, negative acceleration means you are moving to the opposite direction. This is really what it means physically. So assume that your sensor, for some reason, models negative 3.6 to 0, 0 to 1.5, and 3.6 to 3. Good? So now you had three values out of your equation, right? How many unknowns do you have? Well, I have A as unknown, B as unknown, and well, I can really calculate X based on these three things. You could have three values, right? Then afterwards, we know that those values are going to be quantized into the actual number of bits through the, your EGC, right? So zero can be measured by some value, 1.5, if, if we assume 16-bit EGC to be, well, modeled by this integer number and this one modeled by this integer number. The main thing that we are doing in this slide is go through the calibration process, which means set your sensor initially to a known value, do some measurement that is known, to calculate basically A and B based on your X, F, X values, right? So you just really solve a linear equation. That's it, in two unknowns. Make sense? Is there any question? Is this covered in 2DX or some other project? Or did you guys cover how to do, how calibration of sensors really work or? Yes, no. No? Yes? I mean, yes and no, so it's like two different courses or you don't remember, might be, it's a couple of years. OK, so anyway, I mean, this is, this is important to revisit anyway. So understand really when we say you need to calibrate your sensor, how do you calibrate it, right? So why do we calibrate it? What does it really mean mathematically or from a technical perspective to do the calibration? Why is useful? Okay. Good. Some other sensor calibration. Now I'm translating this into what we do in the board. So I'm, I'm taking the accelerometer data sheet. Um, and this is the actual data sheet of our IMU here. If I look into the table to the ratio, this is table three, you find the range as one of the limitations. So it tells you what is the range of the values. And then you find the sensitivity. We said sensitivity is your actual gain of your FX. Is you, This is the, basically the parameter you have in front of your X here. That's the A, right? So it tells you what is the sensitivity range of your, of your sensor. Good. Another limitation is what we call nonlinearity. So far, we have assumed in our calibration that our sensor can be modeled quite accurately by an affine linear equation. Good? In reality, well, not that ideal, right? You might have noises, you might have inaccuracies in the actual electronic circuitry, so it might not be as linear as, as it is. When we say linear, again, it's fx equal ax plus b, so it can be modeled by this linear graph. Nonlinearity in general is some sort of, of a nonlinear equation like that. When the data sheet mentions that, what is the nonlinearity, which is a bit of an inaccuracy or limitation of your sensor, it, it basically gives you a range of how can you, uh, how much you can really trust this affine model, right, of the sensor. <clears throat> and you can imagine if the nonlinearity is small, for example, here, nonlinearity is well, plus or minus 0.5 percent, you can find that. <coughs> excuse me, you can find that the nonlinear actual graph measurement is pretty much following your linear model, right? Which means the inaccuracy is very less, right? You can really trust this. On the other hand, if nonlinearity is 5 percent, plus or minus, then you find that your actual measurement graph is diverging from your your optimal linear uh, uh, line. So in that case. Well, the actual point might be here, but you have measured it here. So the way to understand this is this is not this nonlinear thing is the actual measurement given to you by the, the actual signal itself, right? On the other hand, your modeling would be your this linear linear graph. So you might be assuming based on your calculations, the one that you would do, for example, in lab three, when you read from the ultrasonic or the camera, 
that, well, I have a viewed linear model. This is what I'm going to assume. Any signal I get, I'm going to substitute in my equation, then get x from fx. But if you do this, you might be measuring your x to be here, while in reality it was here, because of the nonlinear uh, uh, nature of your sensor. So you have to factor in nonlinearity in your equation. When you pick a sensor, definitely you want the nonlinearity to be as small as possible, because that means you can really trust or build your whole system model based on that fine linear model of the sensor. Is there any question? Okay. So again, if I go back to the data sheet of the accelerometer with IMU we have, you find here one of the limitations in table three, the nonlinearity, which well, defined here as a derivation from the straight line, so the fine model we defined, it's plus or minus 0.5%, which means it's, it's quite accurate in fact. So why do you care? As I said, as an engineer, like as someone, for example, writing software, assume you are an embedded software engineer in a car that does self driving or anything that takes input from an accelerometer, for example. Well, how accurate is your written algorithm would really depend on how important or how good you understand the limitations of your sensor and factor them in into your algorithm, right? Like I gave you the example of you depend on a pure linear model while your nonlinearity is high for the sensor. All your outputs, in fact, will be inaccurate. Like if you build a drone based on this, you are not using a very accurate uh, accelerometer, for example. You build your machine learning algorithm, you'll find that your drone is not behaving as you expect, right? The reason is, well, you are not factoring the actual realities of the sensors you are using. Another limitation, uh, and the good thing is you already know this from before, as you mentioned, is that the sampling uh, or related to this, this, the resolution of your of your sensor. So we know that we are measuring, again, a physical analog quantity. But at the end of the day, I'm translating this into a digital signal. So I do quantization and I do sampling. And your sampling rate, the higher the sampling rate, the more samples you collect from analog signal, which means the more accurate you are, but the more hardware you need and the more costs you need to pay. So in our IMU or in our FMU board, we have a 14-bit EDC. Uh, for the acceleration, and we have a 16-bit EDC for the uh, magnetic uh, measurement, magnetometer, basically. What does it mean? Again, it means that I can quantize any analog signal into 14 bits, which means I have a values up to 2 to the power 14, or 2 to the power 16 for the magnetometer. And this is determined mainly by the EDC, EDC circuitry. Good. And again, this comes back from, if I look into the data sheet, that's the resolution. Uh, that should be somewhere here. I guess I have shown it to you earlier, right? Uh, but you'll find that in the sheet it's written as 14 bit or 16 bit. Another important factor you have to consider is what is the noise in your system? Noise can come from two main sources. The actual environment, which you need to really model yourself, but also comes from the actual design circuitry of the sensor itself, right? Because those circuits, those electronics operate in certain conditions and they are susceptible to certain interference and like intersymbol interference, analog effects, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Most of the sensors, in fact, at uh, most of the either sensors or uh, out outside of the sensors, the actual MCU boards, they add filters to filter out noise, right? So I'm not sure if you covered filtering in some communications courses or Signal processing cores usually cover them, right? Low pass uh, and 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 uh, high pass filters, for example. And then simply, what you want to do with filtering is you 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 have a signal that is coming to you as an input, which is coming from the physical wallet, for example. By nature, it will also include noises, white noise and maybe uh, magnetic noise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You want to be able to eliminate the noise to increase the accuracy and resolution of your measurement, and you do this through filtering. Uh, usually filtering is done through some sort of, uh, well, a model. I mean, I'm giving you one example model, which is exponential weighted moving average. So you do a moving average, and then this is very good in removing the white noise. But well, filters is a course on its own. But the idea is clear. What is important for us at the system level is how does the noise impact us and what kind of filtering we add in our modules. So again, if I go back to the data sheet of the IMU, it tells you, well, this is a low noise because 
well, it can in fact uh, get a noise that is less than this factor, and uh, this is an acceleration noise, and this is measured at this certain bandwidth, and then you can get this magnetometer noise within this bandwidth, right? So it tells you the best operating bandwidth and what is the maximum noise you can get within that range. Yeah, here you can also find the 14-bit, 16-bit thing that I mentioned earlier. Okay, another system, embedded system level factor of sensors is failures. Sensors are electronic circuitry, right? So they can fail, they can lose power, they can uh, become malfunctioning, and we have to accommodate for this. Uh, some sensors are res less resilient than other sensors, which means they fail more frequently, and hence you need to factor this in in your system. Some common causes of wear and tear, based, based on the usage. And every single electronic device has uh, uh, an assumed lifetime, basically. Uh, and uh, well, this is another factor of certification, in fact. Like for certification entities, they mandate that the lifetime of the electronic device used in cars, for example, live more than what is the expected lifetime of the car itself. Right? It's one reason why you don't want to buy a very old car, even if it's not used at all, it's brand new, but it's like 12 years old, right? And the reason is, well, things really get older, whether they are used or not, including electronics and mechatronic uh, and, and mechanical aspects of the car. Additional reasons that might accelerate, in fact, the malfunctioning or the failures of the sensors, well, obstruction, bad weather, especially if you're operating on out outdoors, and the part here, if you are a, a system design engineer, you cannot really assume all your sensors are operating correctly all the way uh, in under all conditions, and, and you expect that, right? Think of you are uh, well, you are a pilot in in a, in a in a plane, and then you say, well, for this plane to arrive safely, I have to make sure that throughout my plane uh, flight time, which might be 14 hours, for example, all my electronics, all my sensors are operating 100% correctly, right? And if one fails while losing the plane, uh, no one is going to fly that uh, that that plane, right? The reason is failures sometimes happen unexpectedly, but then they might be more common than what you expect. So instead of saying I have to operate on the ideal condition, what you need to design the system for is again resiliency, which means even if failures happen, I can still really have the system functioning as expected, right? And this includes redundancy, which what we mentioned earlier. In, in, in avionics, for example, this concept of uh, uh, treble redundancy, they call it TMR, right? it's the treble modular redundancy, where every single, and it's mandated by the certification as well, every single critical, very critical aspect of your uh, avionics electronic component, you have to be really replicate three times, not only two. One question, why not two, why three? Just think of it, it's another bonus part. Think of it like as, a, as an internship uh, question that you want to think on the spot. So why I want triple redundancy, not, not double redundancy. Yeah. Good. Yes, and if I have two, what happens? Exactly. So there is no other way to tell whether the other one is the correct one. So the idea is if you have double redundancy, if one malfunctions, how do you really know which one is the correct one, right? It's, there is no way for you to really even do this judgment, right? So please send me your name after. Right? Uh, so so triple redundancy is, is mainly an election system, right? So you really want to say if two are working, then this is the correct result, and maybe the third one is the, the one that is not really... Uh, functioning correctly. And by the way, this triple redundancy is not really very resilient as well, because if an attacker from a security perspective knows that you're doing this election mechanism, what they can do is, well, I mean, function two might be tougher, but once you do this, they know definitely you take that decision, right? Uh, so it's called the majority count uh, uh, redundancy. Anyway, let's go back to it. So, so I need to really design my system to be able to accommodate for failures. Good. An example of a sensor failure, and this is, let me see, I had a couple of instances, which one of them is that? This is the FUBN one that, it's, it's a very recent example. Um, I don't know if you heard about this, but the 737 had caused a lot of issues and caused a lot of problems. 
uh, uh, well, to, to the market failure. So here I explain really what what would happen, like what have happened from a central perspective that led to this disaster. Uh, I wouldn't go deeply into the detail. I have a link for you to read through that crash. And maybe if you want, next time we can discuss in detail if someone is interested and have a question. How does technically this sensor, uh, uh, this this instance was a sensor failure? Okay. Well, we already mentioned redundancy and voting system, majority outcome, TMR. Um, another example of a failure, but it's, it's a failure uh, that even with redundancy, it wasn't able to solve it. This is the Lufthansa 2014 in instance. And, and the idea is, well, I have these three sensors that really measured exactly the same quantity. I have the majority count. The problem that happened is the two, two of the three sensors, in fact, froze. And because they froze, they gave the, 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 the wrong outcome while the, the operating sensor is, in fact, working correctly. The problem is with the TMR of three modular redundancy, you are taking the majority count, even if it's incorrect. And this was really a, a reason for that failure. So redundancy is not always the solution there. Another limitation, and, and this is a more advanced limitation, is from security perspective. And, and again, this is an open area still in flux, a lot of research papers, a lot of industry and hackers uh, community uh, examples. Uh, I have a couple of videos that I will show you you guys can really watch later on. But one example is what we call a drone hack. So it's called a spoofing attack. So, and it has been shown, in fact, in, in reality, in an actual UAV. Um, do you know what is sensor spoofing? Or does anyone know what is spoofing? Okay, so it, that means it, it would be interesting for you to really watch that, that instance. And the other one is, uh, uh, well, intentionally adding a crafted noise to the system to see how the system will behave, right? So it's not now the systems are designed for normal noise, for electronic noise, but what if an attacker carefully crafts a noise that really causes a damage of the system, right? Okay, this is the example of the noise I was mentioning to you earlier. So they were targeting the gyroscope sensor. It was published in 2015, and they have a, a very nice video that, that can show you that. Um, spoofing is basically, it's, it's, it's like you try to, uh, well, assume, for example, I have a drone, and then I have uh, our base station where you really control that drone. And there is some sort of communication, wireless communication between both. It's very similar to uh, the example I gave you, keyless car, where you can really still close your, like, uh, what was it called? Locate and still lose it, right? You can still lock your car using the wireless key, but then you can lose it. How did you lose it if someone would locked into the video? It's in fact, what we call spoofing. Spoofing means I can intercept a signal in a system, try to understand it, and then craft another signal that goes to the receiver, which is a genuine signal from a receiver perspective, and then it changes the behavior of the system, right? And here, this is a setup that shows really how you can uh, do spoofing signals. Uh, well, you intentionally send certain signals to the receiver, which here is the UAV, that think it's coming from the actual base station, but it's not. Okay, we have discussed a lot about sensors. What about actuators? So uh, two topics related to the actuators, related and, and mainly to the lab, DC motors, and including servos as well and BWF, plus width modulation. Um, I would assume in tutorials you have covered BWM, not yet. We have one tutorial that goes through BWM in detail, but I, I might also cover this in, in the lecture um, in, in some high level. I would also assume in 2DX you have dealt a lot with BWM. It's one of the very common. Uh, is that correct? That's what I hear from last year. Yeah, OK, yeah, thanks. So what is a DC motor? Again, a DC motor is an actuator, which means you take a signal from the cyber world. Here is from the, the actual uh, uh, processor, microprocessor, and translate. Uh, and, and you want really to, well, one step back. 
we know that the DC motor is controlled by AC, right? So, which is a controller. So, the controller takes a signal from the uh, microprocessor, in our case, the M4 processor, and then feeds the BWM signal to the motor. The motor takes the signal and then behaves according, changes speed or even direction. The way the motor works is again, this is a very basic mechanical theory. It transforms electrical energy into mechanical energy. Uh, I wouldn't really go into detail about this, but one interesting thing from an embedded system aspect is whether you use brushed motors or brushless motors. Uh, in fact, in last year, we tried both things. To be honest, I don't recall. It has been very long time since I have done these laws in my undergrad. Uh, I should check that. So what you are saying that this is a this is this is the wrong law. Yeah. Lawrence, oh no, but that's okay. Let me check that. Thanks for thanks for the note. Uh, there is some sort of a law as an embedded system engineer that someone has bought and the theory of the operation of the DC motor operates based on it, right? So the basics of the law is you can transform an electric energy to a mechanical energy through this shaft thing, right? That's that's really the basic theory. And this is what we care about in, 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 in from our system level perspective. Uh, but we have to be accurate as well. So I, I appreciate this and I will visit it and check it back. Um, the important difference between brushed and brushless motors, and by the way, our car can work for both and we tried it for both. Uh, for brushed motors, you use mechanical switches to change the, the, the current basically, while in brushless, in fact, you use the electronic components. So you don't use the, the mechanical parts. There are some videos here that really show you how does the DC motor work. Uh, it's, it's a nice animation, so I advise you, you go through it. In our lab, um, well, you have the car already assembled, but if you it off and then you look into what, how connections are really happening, this is our DC motor that is connected to the ESC, and then this is the ESC that is connected directly to the BWM output of the, uh, the GMO output of the FMU. Good. So the signal goes from the processor to the EEC, the controller, and the controller controls the motor. Good. Another motor we have in, in our lab is the servo motor. And the servo motor is needed for, for the car or, or generally for robots to change uh, the angle, not, not the direction. So in, um, well, it's implicitly direction as well. But the DC motor changed two things, forward or backward, and the speed. It cannot really change the angle itself. So you need the servo for this. So if you look into our car, and I have this example later on, the servo is really con controlling the orientation. So the servo, as well as the DC motor, we can in fact have a full control of the car orientation, speed, and direction. For, for a, a, a servo motor or a general DC motor, our closed loop, closed loop is, is the concept of the control systems, right? because cyber physical systems are fundamentally control systems. So you have the controller. Controller is feeding voltage, which is BWM, to the DC motor. The DC motor is controlling in whatever it's controlling, whether it's the orientation of the angle or the speed of the direction. And then there is some sort of a sensor on that motor. For example, we have the motor or the wheel speed sensor on an actual driving self-driving car. You measure the signal back, and then this is your feedback loop, you feed this back to your processing system, and then you keep really actuating according, right? So it's a closed loop. It's not really an open loop uh, uh, operation. And this closed loop operation is the one that is fundamentally adding the timing budget constraint on embedded systems, because you want to close this loop within a time budget. Otherwise, if you don't feed, if you don't really measure the error, correct it and feed it back to the motor, for example, you might be really crashing your car, right? If it doesn't happen, if this happens in a minute, wow, and your car speed is uh, 60 miles per hour, 60 kilometers per hour, which is in fact, our car can go up to 60 kilometers per hour, so it's very high speed, then no, you lose your car, right? So you have to close your loop very fast. Most of the actual timing constraints in embedded systems coming from this control system perspective. Okay, here looking into, this is our servo here. If you look, I, I hope you can have some view still even within the assembled car, uh, but this is our servo that again is connected directly to the FMU. A concept that controls both the servo and 
the, the DC motor from the EC is the BWM, a bus width modulation. So how does it really work? Again, it's coming from the need or the challenge of, I want to translate something digital into analog, right? So I want to have some sort of encoding, right? So the way this encodes for motors, mostly as a use case is through the BWM. So I modulate the duty cycle of my, well, square wave, which is ones and zeros, but, but now I'm not only transferring ones and zeros, I'm transferring ones and zeros and it's very certain encoding, which is the duty cycle itself. Uh, and by this duty cycle, I'm able to change the speed, which is one of the experiments of you, you do in lab one, right? By changing BWM, you may really measure what is the speed you get, right? And you feed this through the, your, your terminal. So, well, th this is the direct one. I believe in the lab, you are given the DC motor one and you are asked to do the servo, right? So you experiment with the DC motor through the BWM, you fill in the table, and then you do it for the servo. For the servo, well, I, 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 I can do exactly the same encoding. It's, it's only a matter of coming up with a model or an equation, right? You have the BWM, you want to change, well, the degree or the orientation of your servo. So you need to come up with an equation that makes the degree of the angle a function of the BWM duty cycle, right? This is really how, how does it work. For example, I can say, well, one uh, millisecond duty cycle is referring to a zero degree, which means I'm all straight. 1.5 millisecond is 90 degree. Two millisecond is 180 degree, right? And then you build some sort of that that uh, model or equation and, and, and you, you encode it accordingly. In lab one, again, you are given the modeling equation because for the DC motor, but then you are asked to model the servo one. Good. So to summarize what we have, well, sensors are your me as an embedded system to sense the physical environment. So this is your input because you cannot really understand and then control the physical environment without sensing the different angles, the, the different aspects you need from the physical wallet. So sensors is your me for this. Well, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, without sensors and actuators, we don't have an actual embedded system. So they are essential for almost all embedded systems. We have this, we have discussed couple of things. Well, in fact, three things. The first one is the general considerations, analog versus digital, sampling, quantization, ETC, DAC. But this was a very brief discussion. But then we discussed how does some sensors that are commonly used and also used in our lab do work in theory, and I kind of give you some pointers into details. Uh, but then more importantly, I believe might be new for some of you, is what are the trade-offs and considerations for sensors and how to get the information need from the data sheet that really can control your model as a system and in, as an embedded system engineer or even embedded software engineer. Uh, this includes well, in calibration, linearity, noise, sampling, failure, and some other security uh, aspects. Uh, well, to be honest, security is the least focus on the industry. It's still in flux, uh, so it's something that might not you might not see if you have been in some sort of internship you, or you go and work as an embedded system engineer, but it's interesting. Um, and then actuators, this is the other side of the equation. So I sense it the physical wallet. I'm able to understand what does it do and what action I need to take if I need to take any action. And then now I need to take the action because without the action, you are a passive system, right? So actuators is what makes the embedded system an active system because it controls the physical wallet. Some embedded systems are only passive, which are meant for logging tickets. For example, maintenance, um, uh, well, car maintenance, for example, which is one of, of the industry areas for embedded systems right now. You are only logging stuff. You don't really uh, do the maintenance yourself as an embedded system, but rather you have sensors that are placed everywhere in your car. In fact, right now they put it even in concrete and uh, uh, like lumber systems, etc. But the idea is the same. I have sensors that collect data this data is locked, processed, and for historical reasons, as well as some other human is going to come and look, give a lock and determine, okay, I need a maintenance right now. You go a little bit further and maybe analyze this data and give those alerts yourself, but you don't control the physical, right? From the healthcare domain, it's an ECG sensor that collects the ECG data, maybe uh, also uh, the blood pressure and maybe oxygen levels, etc. But I don't control anything in the patient. So I'm only a passive system for data collection. 
On the other hand, compare this to a base maker, which have an ECC, ECG sensor, collect the data, but based on the collected data, I actuate, I change the base in the base maker. So I affect the physical world, which in this case is the patient itself, right? So there are passive embedded systems, which might not have any actuators, but actuators are fundamental in any active embedded system. Good. And then we give the examples of motors and BWM uh, that we use in the lab. By this, we conclude the lecture. Um, let me know if you have questions or you can come by. Other than this, I uh, all the best with lab one demos next week and see you on Thursday. Sorry, Professor. Yeah, 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 okay. I just covered this slide, so do I need to elaborate more on? I remember, so these were up to Ramen slides. Uh, no, uh, 